through the description of the creation in our other series on Shiv Purana, the Srishti Khanda of the Rudra Sanghita. And this is describing the creation from the point of view of Dvaita, duality, and Vishishta Dvaita, conditioned non-duality. So as a counterpoint to this, I've been discussing Mandukya Upanishad, which looks at the creation from the other side, <laughs> from the side of Ajatavada, non-duality. Uh, this is sort of a contrast to balance the description of the cosmos as something that's real. Because although it may appear to be real to us, it's actually not real at all. It's simply imaginary, like the rope seen as a snake in the twilight. Maybe the person is a little bit drunk or they forgot their glasses. <laughs> and they see this rope, but they imagine it to be a snake. Now, does the snake have any real existence? No, it's not possible. Is the snake part of the rope? No, that's not possible either, because the rope is just a rope. The snake only exists as an imagination in the mind. And because we have experiences in the past with snakes and we have some fear of snakes, the mind, which is trying to guard the body against any kind of problems, says, hey, maybe that's a snake, you know. <laughs> oh, it's a snake. So we become afraid. Or, for example, a tiger seen in a dream or any other similar scary dream. As soon as we wake up, we realize, oh, it's just an illusion. It can't hurt me. And the same is true of the material world, the creation. Now, to the great demigods like Brahma, Indra, even Vishnu, the material world appears perfectly real. And later on, in the Mandukya Upanishad commentary, Shankaracharya says the reason for this is that the demigods only have Dvaitavada consciousness, Jagrat consciousness. They see the multiplicity of the world as being real. But it's not real at all. And the proof is that it has to be created. If it was real, it would exist forever, beginningless and endless. But the only thing that exists forever is the imagination, the maya, the world, as seen, as real. So let's go into the next shloka, the next verse of Mandukya Upanishad. Bhavayar asad birevaya madvayena chatkalpitaha Bhava ap yadvayenaiva tasmad advayata shiva This Atman is imagined both as unreal objects that are perceived and as the non-duality. 
The objects, bhavas, are imagined in the non-duality itself. Therefore, non-duality alone is the highest bliss. So let's unpack this. <laughs> this Atman is imagined. Why is it called imagined if it's the only thing that's real? Oh, we're getting a nice rainstorm. Yeah. We imagine it because we see it as something outside ourselves. We see Atman or Brahman or Shiva as something different from ourselves or that we are separate and individual. This is imagination. This is like the snake imagined in the rope. Because we have a history of being an individual or seeing ourselves or imagining ourselves as an individual, just like we have a history of knowing about snakes as being something dangerous, we imagine the snake in the rope and we imagine the empirical self, the ego. Now, who does all this imagining? The mind. The mind is the root of the ego. The ego is that collection of thoughts, that structure, that mental arrangement that sees ourself as being separate and individual. And this is the cause of suffering. This is the cause of fear. Just like seeing the snake in the rope makes us afraid, or seeing the tiger in a dream. But when we wake up, when we see things as they really are, there's no reason to talk about Atman or Brahman or non-duality. These are also imaginary. Wrap your head around this one. Here we've been saying that Brahman and Shiva and non-duality is the only reality. And now we're saying that they're imaginary. Why? Because non-duality can only exist in contradistinction to duality. And if duality is an illusion, imaginary, then non-duality is also imaginary. See, it's just like when people say, Brahman is one, or God is one, or Atman is one. No, not from the point of view of Atman. Atman isn't counting, isn't keeping score. Why? Because there's nothing to compare it to. To be able to count even to one, you have to compare it to zero or to two. And that can only happen in Jagrat. That can only happen in duality. <laughs> this is crazy, isn't it? So in other words, the concept of non-duality <laughs> requires duality to exist. The concept of Brahman requires Maya to exist. The con concept of Atma, the universal self, requires the existence of the individual self as a contrast, as a way to delimit it. But Actual Atman, actual Brahman, the actual self has no boundaries. No boundaries means you can't count, huh? because one is different from zero, one is different from two, and three, and four, and so on. But there are no zero, one, two, three, and four in non-duality. So then what are we talking about? Well. These concepts are from the scriptures. And Shankaracharya, in his commentary on this shloka, says that the scriptures are part of duality. 
They are not needed when one attains non-duality. When one attains self-realization, he no longer needs to take shelter of scriptures. Scriptures are a tool. They're like a ladder that brings you up to the higher states of consciousness. The scriptures are saying, in karma yoga, perform sacrifice. In bhakti yoga, develop love for God. In raja yoga, meditate. And the ultimate meditation is on nothingness. And finally, in jnana yoga, aham brahmasmi, tattvamasi, I am Brahman. You are also that. Sarva kalvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahma. Everything is Atma. Everything is Shiva. We call by different names, but it really is the same thing. Buddhists call it Nibbana or Nirvana, but it's the same or emptiness, or nothingness, or the void. Huh? In the uh, Devi Kalotra Tantra, Shiva recommends meditation on the void. Now that seems odd. Why doesn't he recommend meditation on himself? Or on Shakti? You notice the last word of this shloka is Shiva, with a long A, the feminine ending. Shiva and Shiva, Shiva and Shakti. They are the ultimate, they are the highest bliss. But even in Brahman, <laughs> there is no concept of bliss. There is no concept of happiness because it would have to be in distinction with unhappiness. And there's no unhappiness there. There's no fear, there's no desire no longing, no urge to be or become or have something else. Because everything is there. All desires are satisfied. So in this way, <laughs> we go back to Ramana Maharshi. You might ask, well then, what is the utility of reading Shiva Purana? Why should we study these dualist scriptures? Even though they're connected with non-duality, still they tell so many stories and so on, descriptions of the creation. And if the creation is illusory, why bother? The answer is given by Ramana Maharshi. I quoted this before, but I'll quote it again. Because the world is seen, we have to infer a common cause, a Lord possessing unlimited powers to appear as the diversity the pictures consisting of names and forms, the seer, the canvas, the light, all these are he himself. So just see the careful choice of words here. We have to infer a common cause. You might as well say we have to imagine the existence of God. A Lord possessing unlimited powers to appear as the diversity. In other words, it's an appearance. Both the diversity and the Lord are ultimately appearances in the world of Maya. These uh, different representations of God in various religions and spiritual teachings are only metaphors. I've been saying this for years. I don't know why nobody gets it. <laughs> They're only metaphors that allow us to grasp some aspect of the reality, part of that ladder, uh, the next rung on which we can pull ourselves up to a higher state. And by doing this consistently over a long period of time, we can decondition the mind from all these material memories that cause us to imagine the existence of diversity Jagrat, the many objects in the world. And that leads to the attainment of pure jnana, or Brahman, or ultimate enlightenment. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.
ओम नमः शिवाय